A stunning scene in Texas. A small passenger plane with 21 people on board goes down near Houston. The plane completely in flames, and yet everyone escaped the wreckage safely without any serious injuries. The private jet was bound for Boston, expected to take passengers to game four of the World Series there between the Red Sox and the Houston Astros. Overseas tonight, a $17 million ransom demand. Tonight, the FBI is making contact with a violent gang suspected of kidnapping 17 missionaries in Haiti, 16 Americans, a Canadian, and five children among the group. Marcus Moore is in Haiti again for us tonight. Fireworks on Capitol Hill tonight. The January 6th Commission taking steps to hold Steve Bannon accountable for refusing to comply with their subpoena. Tonight, the FBI raiding two homes linked to a Russian oligarch living in New York and Washington, D.C. What we're learning tonight about his ties to Vladimir Putin and former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort. The nationwide supply shortage raising prices on everyday household items from detergent to diapers. School lunches running low on food and supplies. When will it end? And it's a Netflix series that has taken the world by storm. Tonight, we are in South Korea getting an up-close look at an old tradition featured on the show Squid Game that now has super fans flocking to this candy shop. Remember this? This shop actually made about 700 of these and sold it to the filmmakers of Squid Game. And there are so many people in line. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with some scary moments near Houston after a small plane with 21 people on board crashed shortly after takeoff. Miraculously, though, everyone on board the plane managed to escape without any serious injuries. A very relieved first responder calling it a day of celebration. And when you see what the plane looked like shortly after the crash, you can certainly understand why officials are so thankful. By the time first responders arrived, the MD-87 plane was fully engulfed in flames. The small plane with 18 passengers and three crew members on board was headed to Boston for game four of the World Series between the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox. Now tonight, the investigation into just what happened is getting underway. Why did the pilots choose to abort the takeoff so late, and why couldn't they stop the plane in time? Our Zareen Shah leads us off tonight. Tonight, thick black smoke billowing into the sky, flames engulfing this passenger plane, crashing after trying to take off from Houston's executive airport. I do have visual of a plane that's fully engulfed. That wreckage yards from the end of the airport runway. First responders racing to the field to put out the fire. But what it appears is that that plane has virtually disintegrated. Chelsea Alfaro with a nearby road crew calling 911. I was sitting here and I saw in the rearview mirror, I just saw it go boom and it was a big orange explosion. Miraculously, all 21 people on board, 18 passengers, the youngest just 10 years old, and three crew escaping from the fiery cabin. Only two people suffering minor injuries. Just before takeoff, everything appears normal. The McDonnell Douglas MD-87 is seen taxing on the tarmac. Soon barreling down that runway, captured here just moments before the crash. The airplane uh, rolled down the run run runway, a struck an actual fence and from there uh, became disabled. In that runway video, a puff of smoke seen emerging from one of the engines. Experts say it's too soon to know whether that had anything to do with the crash. And you can see what appears to be tire tracks extending from the end of the runway to the crash scene. It's clear that the pilots were trying to abort this takeoff at some point. But the real question is, is why were they not able to stop in time and why did they abort so late? That's what's going to be answered by the cockpit voice recorders. Our station, KTRK, reporting the plane was heading to Boston for game four of the American League Championship Series between the Houston Astros and the Boston Red Sox. Those passengers lucky to be alive. No one's deceased. And man, that is an awesome feeling right now for us as first responders. Zareen Shah joins us from the crash site outside of Houston. And Zareen, great to see everyone on board there made it off safely. Just incredible that they all survived. Yeah, Lindsay, it's a happy ending. So the reason why everyone survived is experts are saying the end of that runway is essentially a farmer's field. It's very flat, no rocks, few trees. And so that plane just skidded to a stop and that evacuation then went quick, beating that inferno. And the plane also did some damage, knocking out power to nearby residents. What happened with that? 
Yes, yeah, so the local utility says that the power outage was caused by the plane taking out a power line during that aborted takeoff. About 2,000 people lost power, but most of them have it back. Lindsay. All right, good news all around. Zareen Shaw, our thanks to you. Now to the pandemic and the major news on boosters tonight. The FDA has signaled that they will approve mixing and matching booster vaccines, but not necessarily recommend it. This comes as the CDC is set to debate the same issue. ABC's Ariel Reshef has the latest. Tonight, an expected green light from the FDA could be hours away for some Americans who want to mix vaccines by boosting their original vaccine with a different brand. A source telling ABC News regulators will likely still recommend people get the same vaccine brand for their booster shot, but it won't be required. We now know that J&J wanes more quickly than the mRNA vaccines, and being able to give more options to patients is important. There is some evidence that people who got the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine may benefit more from a booster with an mRNA vaccine. A limited study looking at antibodies, which is just one measure of protection, found that an extra shot of the same Johnson & Johnson vaccine boosted antibodies by four times. But when J&J &J was boosted with Pfizer, antibodies jumped 35 times and 76 times after a boost with Moderna. Some who got the J&J &J vaccine still want to stick with it for their booster shot. Yeah, I'd rather stay with one course and just keep it that way. Vaccinations are driving cases down across the country. But in 10 states with colder climates, as more people spend time inside, cases and hospital admissions are climbing again. I really do not want to see another horrific fall winter wave like we saw uh, last year, and I think it's possible. And tonight, experts are calling for more aggressive study on new variants. A descendant of Delta, AY.4.2, now makes up at least 6% of cases in the UK, where COVID deaths just hit their highest point since March. Researchers here in the U.S. are using genomic sequencing to identify and track new variants. From the data that I've seen, um, cases of the AY4.2 have been seen in about five states, maybe about seven cases total. 99% of U.S. cases are Delta, but scientists want to know whether this new variant is more transmissible. We need to remain vigilant uh, whether uh, this variant will turn out to be a problem or, or not. Until this is controlled everywhere in the world, we all remain at risk. Ariel Reshev joins us now. And Ariel, let's get back to that FDA guidance on mixing and matching with these boosters and that new study that people who got the J&J &J vaccine may get better results with a different vaccine booster. Where do we think the expert guidance will land us ultimately on this issue? Well, it, Lindsay, a CDC advisory panel is expected to meet, debate, and vote on mixing vaccines on Thursday. Then the CDC director can sign off with her final recommendations soon after that. But it's expected that the CDC will say that mixing vaccines is safe and that it's up to the patients and their providers to decide which vaccine to get. Lindsay? Ariel Resha, far thanks to you. We turn now to Washington, where the House committee investigating the January 6th riot is moving to recommend that former Trump advisor Steve Bannon be held in criminal contempt for defying their subpoena. But former President Trump is pushing back, suing the committee for harassment and claiming executive privilege to block their investigation. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. Tonight, the House January 6th committee is voting to recommend criminal charges against Trump ally Steve Bannon for refusing to cooperate with its investigation into the Capitol riot. We're left with no other choice than to ask the Justice Department, lock him up, and hold him in contempt. And uh, clearly, that might send enough of a message that he will agree to talk to us. In a 26-page report, the committee alleges, quote, Bannon had specific knowledge about the events planned for January 6th before they occurred. The report points to Bannon's own words on January 5th, the day before the riot. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. Just understand this. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. It's going to be moving. It's going to be quick. There's going to be many moving pieces. Bannon told his fans, this is your time in history. It's not going to happen like you think it's going to happen, okay? It's going to be quite extraordinarily different. And all I can say is strap in. You have made this happen, and tomorrow it's game day. 
Bannon says he is refusing to cooperate at the direction of Trump himself in the name of executive privilege, the right of a president to confidential advice from his aides. This although Trump fired Bannon, booting him from the White House more than three years before the riot. And let's bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, former President Trump has now filed a lawsuit trying to block the committee from accessing White House records. Uh, what's the former president claiming in that suit? Uh, there are a variety of claims in this lawsuit. On one hand, the lawsuit alleges that there is no legislative purpose uh, for these documents, also alleging executive privilege is being violated here, that the president uh, has a right to keep his uh, deliberations with his staff, uh, former staff, in this case, confidential. Uh, that's the argument. The big picture argument, Lindsay, uh, the former president is making is that this is a biased committee, an illegitimate committee. In the lawsuit, the lawyers act actually call it, and I want to read the quote uh, directly to you, a vexatious illegal fishing expedition. Vexatious illegal vexatious. fishing yeah. expedition. Okay. And, and President Biden has now weighed in on the subpoena battle, saying the Justice Department should take action. How did the White House respond to questions today on whether it was appropriate for the president to weigh in? Uh, the White House quickly clarified the president's uh, remarks, uh, you might say uh, reversed them, uh, saying that this is a decision that will be made entirely by the Justice Department, uh, despite what the president said. He, he was asked directly, do you think uh, that, the, that these people should be prosecuted if they don't cooperate with the committee? The president answered directly, yes. Uh, but Jen Psaki, the press secretary, said uh, that in reality here, the decision will be made not at the White House, not by the president, but by the Attorney General. Jonathan Carl, our thanks to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Next to the FBI raid on homes in New York and D.C. linked to a Russian oligarch and close ally of Vladimir Putin. That oligarch was previously sanctioned by the U.S. and also appeared in the Mueller report linked to former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort. So what's behind the raids? Here's ABC's chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas. Tonight, the FBI raiding the Washington and New York homes associated with a Russian oligarch with ties to Vladimir Putin. The U.S. government continuing to intensify the pressure against Oleg Deripaska, who the Treasury Department has previously sanctioned, stating Deripaska has been investigated for money laundering and has been accused of threatening the lives of business rivals, illegally wiretapping a government official, and taking part in extortion and racketeering. There are also allegations that Deripaska had links to Russian organized crime. Today, the FBI carting out boxes from two properties valued in the millions of dollars. While no charges have been filed, Deripaska has faced FBI scrutiny before. Former special counsel Bob Mueller detailing his ties to former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort. Sources say the case has no ties to former President Trump. The Treasury Department has sanctioned senior Russian government officials and oligarchs like Deripaska, who they claim benefit from the Putin regime and play a key role in advancing Russia's malign activities. Deripaska has sued the U.S. government, claiming the sanctions against him are based on nothing but false rumor. His spokesman told Russian state media today that those raided homes are not his property. Lindsay? Pierre, thank you. Next to the nationwide supply shortage that's now translating into price hikes for all of us. Tonight, what Procter & Gamble is saying and what prices will be first to rise. Here's ABC's chief business and economics correspondent, Rebecca Jarvis. Tonight, Procter & Gamble, maker of Tide detergent and Crest toothpaste, the latest in a growing list of companies announcing price hikes on many household staples in response to mounting problems with the supply chain. In a call with investors today, the company, which already raised the price of Pampers diapers earlier this year, said it is limiting how much some retailers can buy to prevent hoarding and changing up shipping routes to get around bottlenecks. The news comes as a record-breaking 100 ships wait to unload at the ports of L.A. and Long Beach. Our Martha Raddatz showing us right here in recent days what the bottleneck looks like up close. There are more than 60 container ships anchored here. Normally, there wouldn't be any. And these are the ones we can see. Out beyond here, there are dozens more waiting to anchor. Now, Union Pacific Railroad joining those ports running 24-7. On Monday, the American Apparel and Footwear Association called on the president to incentivize the use of the National Guard and or utilize naval ports to help unlock port congestion. Our Cecilia Vega pressing the White House. 
Are those options? I'm not here to take options off the table, but I will say we have made a great deal of progress already. The consequences of the supply chain chaos hitting nearly every industry, even schools. It's impacting everything from uh, food items and non-food items, such as serving trays and plastic ware. The schools are really scrambling to get those kind of items. The impact's just so far-reaching here. Rebecca Jarvis joins us now. And, and Rebecca, while the Port of Los Angeles deals with tremendous backlogs, it sounds like another California port is saying that they can help. The Port of Oakland has stepped in, Lindsay, and they say while they are seeing increased interest in their port this year, they have not seen the kinds of backlogs that the Port of L.A. and Long Beach are experiencing. So they're saying we're open for business. Come ship to us. Now, it's important to keep in mind here, while this is great and it will help some of that backlog, this is a much bigger issue than just ships waiting at ports. You have factories that were shut down during the pandemic that have gone down sporadically radically throughout the pandemic, creating these various items from smartphones to sneakers to toys to sofas that are all backlogged themselves. You have on the flip side of it here on the ground, a shortage of workers, truckers, warehouse workers. So this whole issue, when you hear supply chain, it is all these elements of the supply chain, not just purely uh, those ports, which make for great pictures and are certainly a big piece of this situation. But I've talked to a lot of small business owners and they even said, when things started moving 24 7 yes that will help on some level but that's not going to get a factory that says you're not getting your order until february of this year to get them to send it any sooner lindsay rebecca jarvis our thanks to you for more now let's bring in the vp of supply chain and customs policy the national retail federation mr john gold john thank you so much for your time tonight retail is of course the nation's largest private sector employer each day now we're hearing about new shortages and new plans to address the situation what do you think the most urgent concern is at this moment hi lindsay thanks for having me on tonight i think right now it's trying to address the ongoing challenge of the congestion we're facing at our ports. We've got to be able to get through the backlog so we can get the containers out of the yard and get the other vessels in and get those unloaded. But we've known about this backlog for weeks at this point, even longer, but it appears to only be getting worse. So is the White House doing enough to respond to the supply shortages or, or who needs to be taking action at this point? <laughs> I, you know, to be honest, the challenges we're facing today existed well before COVID, but they've been further exacerbated by the, the ongoing pandemic and the surge we've seen in consumer demand. I think the White House is doing a good job by getting the right stakeholders at the table. We need to get together and address the situation and plan for a better supply chain going forwards. But there are some serious issues we need to address with some of the operations and workforce issues that, in order to get the containers moving as quickly as possible. Without really causing a panic here, we've seen reports in some states of milk and meat and other staples running low. Uh, what are retailers telling you that they are, they're having the hardest time restocking at this point? I think across the board, the, there have been a number of challenges throughout the supply chain for products across the board, whether it's the you know meat and vegetables as well as uh, you know apparel, footwear, consumer electronics, hard goods. It's everything that, that moves through the supply chain that has been a challenge. Um, but, I mean, retailers have been having contingency plans in place. They've been working through for, for months now. They're working round the clock to ensure that they have inventory on hand. John, let me get you to, to pull out your crystal ball here. When will all of this end? I, you know, that is the question everybody is asking right now. And I think most experts agree that the disruptions we're seeing across the board in the supply chain, it's not just here in the U.S., but it's globally, we're going to see these well into 2022. But this is why we've got to tackle these issues now, because we know there'll be further disruptions in the future. And we've got to have better resiliency in our supply chain to address the future problems. VP of Supply and Customs Policy of the National Retail Federation, John Gold, we thank you so much for your time and insight. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. When we come back, the major American city voting to remove a statue of Thomas Jefferson from its city hall and the backlash that cancel culture is going too far. And we're standing by for the start of that House committee hearing, looking into Steve Bannon for his defiance of a subpoena that John was talking about just a short time ago. We'll bring it to you live. But up next, our team on the ground in Haiti as those desperate efforts to rescue those kidnapped Americans continues. How will they ultimately be brought safely home Stay with us. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this is by people squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not me. afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. Me a the family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. The first openly transgender cabinet member has now become the country's first openly transgender four-star officer. Admiral Rachel Levine also became the first female four-star officer to lead the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps. Admiral Levine, who is also the Assistant Secretary of Health, called it a momentous occasion. Next to those desperate efforts to rescue a missionary group that was kidnapped in Haiti, the FBI has now made contact with the gang suspected of holding the 16 Americans and one Canadian. They are demanding millions for their safe return. ABC's Marcus Moore once again on the ground for us in Haiti. He actually caught up with a priest who was kidnapped and freed by that suspected gang. Tonight, the violent gang in Haiti accused of kidnapping 17 members of a U.S. Christian organization demanding $17 million for their release, $1 million per hostage, according to a senior Haitian police official. Their demand comes as the FBI makes contact with the 400 Mawozo gang, who Haitian authorities say are holding the group hostage. The FBI is a part of a coordinated U.S. government effort to get the U.S. citizens involved to safety. Uh, also that the U.S. Embassy in Port-au-Prince is coordinating with local authorities and providing assistance to the families to resolve the situation. This comes after a magnitude 7.2 earthquake demolished Haiti's southwestern peninsula back in August, leaving unimaginable damage. It destroyed tens of thousands of homes and killed nearly 2,200 people. This all on top of a poorly managed response to the pandemic, only made worse after the assassination of President Jovenel Moise this past summer. Gangs were already preventing much needed aid by blocking roads and attacking relief convoys. Being in Haiti, anyone in Haiti, you would have to have some kind of fear because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, people are being kidnapped left to right. Uh, you might get pulled over. You might get robbed. Um, you don't know what's going to happen. So anybody here in Haiti, I think everyone here in Haiti has some sense of fear. Um, any foreigner, white person in Haiti is a target. Um, you stick out. And so... You know, they're missionaries, they're Mennonite, they had different type of clothes on, but, you know, they would have stuck, they would have stuck out anyways. But now it's, it's totally random. 
Um, everybody's getting kidnapped. Politicians are getting kidnapped. People in power are getting kidnapped. Missionaries are getting kidnapped. School kids are getting kidnapped. Um, no one's off limits. The rise in violence leading to widespread protests across the capital. And so this is what we've seen here in this part of Port-au-Prince where um, at any moment people will choose to stop vehicles that are trying to drive up the hill. We tried to drive up the road just earlier and we're told to turn around. And so that is just a bit of what life is like right now uh, here in Port-au-Prince. People are angry and uh, they want stability in their country. And tonight, we're learning the ages of those 16 Americans and one Canadian kidnapped. The adults ranging in age from 18 to 48. And among the five children, an eight-month-old baby. The group, part of the Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries, and was in Haiti working on several humanitarian projects, including home building and teaching school children. Before the kidnapping Saturday, they had just visited this orphanage that received support from the organization. So many now praying for their safe return, including Father Jean Millian, who says he and nine others were kidnapped in April by the same gang. They were held for 20 days and then freed. Even the, the time is difficult, but uh, we do not have to, to lose our, our hope in God. Difficult times for sure. Marcus Moore joins us now from Port-au-Prince. And Marcus, have authorities said where the gang might allegedly be holding this missionary group or, or whether they've made any deadlines to that $17 million ransom request? Lindsay, a Haitian police official tells us they believe the missionaries and the children are, are actually somewhere close to Port-au-Prince. He didn't mention a deadline, but he did say that negotiations are underway um, as we speak tonight. Lindsay. And, and Marcus, you also spoke to that priest who was being held. Did he have a message for those who are still being held captive? Um, he did. You know, he was he was held captive for, for 20 days, and uh, he said that the message he wanted to get to the people right now who are being held hostage is not to grow impatient. Uh, he said he hopes that they will, will keep their faith and will believe uh, that one day they will be freed. And, and Lindsay, before we left the monastery there, uh, he insisted that we as a group uh, pray for, the, uh, for those, those missionaries and the children, that they have a safe return uh, from those captors. Lindsay. Remaining faithful about it all. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. Joining us now is ABC News contributor and former senior official for the FBI, Richard Frankel. Richard, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's now been three days since the American missionaries were kidnapped. Give us a reality check of what the situation is on the ground for U.S. officials and what you know about the gang that's behind this. So not much is known about the gang. It's a large gang based out of uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, um, uh, well manned, um, but we're really not sure of uh, um, at this point, at least who's behind the gang, you know, who's in charge um, and, uh, you know, uh, what their uh, goals are other than just to make money. Um, what's going on now is that, uh, as I understand it, um, there has been a request for ransom by the hostage takers or a demand. The demand is for $17 million, $1 million per uh, hostage. And you'll have the families uh, either working through, uh, you know, a representative of the family, a third party negotiator, somebody who is hired by the family, or uh, by somebody associated with the, uh, the church business that they all um, are part of negotiating with the hostage takers in some manner. And it may just be saying, okay, we, we have the demand for them uh, for money, but how are they? Can you, can you send us videos of them? Show us that they're all okay, that they're not injured, um, that they've all survived, um, you know, that there's no illness, uh, 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 everything along that line. Proof of life, I guess it's it's often called. And, and as you just mentioned, kidnappers are demanding a million dollars a person. How do you handle negotiating with a group like this without further incentivizing them to up the price or to kidnap again in the future so they demand even more money? Well, that, that is a concern, uh, not really of the family, to be quite honest. The family, uh, the families, the, you know, their goal is to just get the, uh, uh, you know, the, the hostages back. Um, but... You know, from the from the government perspective, yeah, you don't want to be negotiating with them, giving them everything they've asked for, and then almost um, uh, uh, causing more kidnappings. And so you want to make this, at least from the government perspective, um, harder for them, 
Um, you don't want to make it so hard that they get uh, um, angry and then uh, hurt the, uh, the hostages. So it's a very tight balancing that you have to go through uh, to determine how do you um, negotiate for either less money or no money, um, and how do you make it so that they will not immediately go out and kidnap 17 more hostages. And this is all that's going through the mind of uh, the hostage cell and the government. Such a delicate dance as you just laid out there really clearly for us. And, and of course, you have experience in handling kidnapping negotiations in Haiti. But in the last three months, Haiti experienced not only the earthquake, but their president was assassinated. So how can safe and effective negotiations happen in a country with so much recent instability? Um, you're going into most of the time, areas that are in crisis. Uh, when I was in Haiti in um, you know 2005, uh, the UN basically had control of Haiti. Uh, there were kidnappings uh, weekly. Uh, while we were down there, uh, not just U.S. citizens were being kidnapped, but Canadians were uh, being kidnapped uh, at, at the same time. And so you're trying to work through those issues of uh, just dealing with the crisis of the government. And in Haiti right now, like you said, it, it's in crisis. They've had the, the earthquake, they've had the presidential killing, they've had hostages taken um, on a daily basis at times. And it's not just foreigners. Uh, they're taking uh, school children off the street, they're taking vendors off the street. Um, they're, they're basically taking anyone where they think they can get, you know, a quick buck, you know, some money uh, to get those uh, individuals back. And when they do take Westerners, whether it's U.S. citizens, Canadians, uh, Europeans, um, uh, uh, people from uh, uh, Asia, uh, it, it doesn't matter to them. All they're looking for is somebody who they think has deep pockets, who can pay the negotiators the top dollar, and that's what they're going to go for. Our Marcus Moore, in fact, spoke to a Haitian priest who was kidnapped for 20 days earlier this year. 20 days is a long time. Is there any way to anticipate if, with the U.S. involvement at this point, that this case will be able to be resolved sooner than that? No, that, that's the thing. You know, there, each one is different. It depends on uh, the hostage takers, the hostages, uh, how they're doing. You know, sometimes when a hostage actually is ill, sometimes it's more trouble for the hostage takers, so they want to get rid of the hostages sooner. If they're in good health, then they may want to keep them longer and try to get more money out of the uh, out of the negotiators. Uh, the the fact that we have 17 kidnapped at the same time that is, um, in in my opinion, that's game changing in the sense that when I was doing it, they were kidnapped one, maybe two. They they've got to be able to handle and 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 keep those people. Um, uh, you know, contained so that they can get their money back. And 17, no matter what, it, that's 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 a stretch. And so as we go further into the days, I think you're going to see um, uh, there probably is going to be a strain on both sides. Really helpful background information. Richard Frankel, we thank you so much. Thank you. Still ahead here on Prime, the investigation into the death of a freshman at yet another fraternity house, this time in Kentucky. Our journey to the Korean candy store that has become an Instagram hit because of the hit Netflix show Squid Game. And Kim and Ye are divorcing and dividing up their assets. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, Celine Dion announcing that she has to delay her Las Vegas residency due to an unforeseen medical issue. We are certainly wishing her well. An extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was going to say. Oh, my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. 
Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions. Straightforward reporting. No spin, no hype, no bull. See why Sunday mornings, more and more Americans are now turning first to ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Welcome to This Week. being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're gonna move back, let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everyone. Now to new details about the divorce of the power couple Kim Ye, reality star and mogul Kim Kardashian West and the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. We are keeping up with them by the numbers. Kim has paid her ex $20 million to take sole ownership of the Hidden Hills California mansion they once shared. And she forked over $3 million more for the furnishings, according to newly filed court documents. Meanwhile, the rapper reportedly bought a $57 million beachfront mega mansion in Malibu after selling his Wyoming ranch. Forbes puts his net worth at a whopping $1.8 billion and Kim's at $1 billion. Maybe they should both be wary of the gold digger that the Grammy winner sings about. They're divorcing after nearly seven years of marriage and four kids together. And in case you missed it, the rapper and entrepreneur has now legally changed his name to just two letters, yay. Just yay. No last name, no middle name, just yay. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The disgraced South Carolina attorney accused of misusing funds for the wrongful death of his housekeeper and is a person of interest in the deaths of his wife and son asks for bail how the judge responded. And the dire concerns about the state of children's mental health during this pandemic. But first, you'll look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know? need to know to help you not just get through your day but to make the most of it feel smarter feel better feel happier well how about a third hour of good morning america gma3 what you need to know now streaming on abc news live it's all about you all right here we go you ready Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live.
My favorite show. This is what being live is Free all Maggie. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to take you now live to Washington, where the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot is meeting tonight in a rare primetime hearing where they're expected to recommend that former Trump advisor Steve Bannon be held in criminal contempt for refusing to comply with the committee's subpoena for his testimony. The committee's chairman, Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson, you see him right there, and its vice chair, Republican Representative Liz Cheney, both speaking tonight. Let's take a listen in. U.S. Attorney will do his duty and prosecute Mr. Bannon for criminal contempt of Congress. Our goal is simple. We want Mr. Bannon to answer our questions. We want him to turn over whatever records he possess that are relevant to the select committee's investigation. The issue in front of us today is our ability to do our job. It's about fulfilling our responsibilities according to House Resolution 503 to provide the American people answers about what happened on January 6th and help ensure nothing like that day ever happens again. We fulfill our responsibilities by discovering the facts behind the January 6th attack so that Congress can consider legislation with a full understanding of the activities that led to an attack on Congress itself. I want to make it clear just how isolated Mr. Bannon is in his refusal to cooperate with the select committee. We've reached out to dozens of witnesses. We are taking in thousands of pages of records. We are conducting interviews on a steady basis. This is the shoe leather work of conducting a serious focused investigation. It's not flashy, but it gets results. It's essential that we get Mr. Bannon's factual and complete testimony in order to get a full accounting of the violence of January 6th and its causes. Mr. Bannon stands alone in his complete defiance of our subpoena. That's not acceptable. No one in this country, no matter how wealthy or how powerful is above the law. Left unaddressed, this defiance may encourage others to follow Mr. Bannon down the same path. For folks watching at home this evening, I want you to think about something. What would happen to you if you did what Mr. Bannon is doing? If you were a material witness in a criminal prosecution or some other lawsuit, what would happen if you refuse to show up? Do you think you'd be able to just go about your business? We all know the answer to that. There isn't a different set of rules for Mr. Bannon. He knows this. He knows that there are consequences for outright defiance. And he's chosen the path toward criminal contempt by taking this position. And there are better matters at stake. One of the major questions the select committee is dealing with is whether the rule of law will be able to endure as a pillar of American democracy. After all, we've seen the rule of law put to the test repeatedly in our recent past. While we don't know all the facts, we do know that there was a powerful push to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 election. Americans have been and continue to be lied to about that. We know that ultimately there was a violent attack that interfered with the peaceful transfer of power from one president to another. We know that lies about the outcome of that election haven't gone away. And now we have a key witness who's flat out refusing to comply with a congressional subpoena and cooperate with our investigation. 
the rule of law remains under attack right now. If there are no accountability for these abuses, if there are different sets of rules for different types of people, then our democracy is in serious trouble. As chair of this committee, I won't allow further harm to the rule of law in the course of our work. Mr. Bannon will comply with our investigation or he will face the consequences. Maybe he's willing to be a martyr to the disgraceful cause of whitewashing what happened on January 6th or demonstrating his complete loyalty to the former president. So I want our witnesses to understand something very plainly. If you are thinking or following the path Mr. Bannon has gone down, you are on notice that this is what you'll face. The process we begun tonight is a grave one. It seldom happens, and we'd rather avoid it altogether. But it's not reserved just for Steve Bannon. If other witnesses defy this committee, if they fail to cooperate, we will be back in this room with a new report with the names of whoever else mistakenly believes that they are above the law. We hope no other witnesses put themselves in the situation Mr. Bannon has through his own conduct, but we cannot allow anyone to stand in the way of the select committee as we work to get to the facts. The stakes are just too high. We won't be deterred. We won't be distracted, and we won't be delayed. I urge my colleagues to support the favorable adoption of this report. It's now my pleasure to yield to the distinguished vice chair, my friend, Ms. Cheney of Wyoming, for any statements she would care to offer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. On January 6th, a mob breached the security perimeter of our Capitol assaulted and injured more than 140 police officers, engaged in hand-to-hand -hand violence over an extended period, and invaded and occupied the United States Capitol building, all in an effort to halt the lawful counting of electoral votes and reverse the results of the 2020 election. The day before this all occurred, on January 5th, Mr. Bannon publicly professed knowledge that, quote, all hell is going to break loose tomorrow, end quote. He forecast that the day would be, quote, extraordinarily different than what most Americans expected. He said to his listeners and his viewers, quote, so many people said, if I was in a revolution, I would be in Washington. Well, he said, this is your time in history. Based on the committee's investigation, it appears that Mr. Bannon had substantial advanced knowledge of the plans for January 6th and likely had an important role in formulating those plans. Mr. Bannon was in the war room at the Willard on January 6th. He also appears to have detailed knowledge regarding the president's efforts to sell millions of Americans the fraud that the election was stolen. In the words of many who participated in the January 6th attack, the violence that day was in direct response to President Trump's repeated claims from election night through January 6th that he had won the election. The American people are entitled to Mr. Bannon's firsthand testimony about all of these relevant facts. But as the chairman noted, Mr. Bannon is refusing to provide it. Preserving our Constitution and the rule of law is a central purpose of this investigation. The plain fact here is that Mr. Bannon has no legal right to ignore the committee's lawful subpoena. So far, Mr. Bannon's excuse is that former President Trump wishes to invoke some form of executive privilege for a subset of the relevant topics. President Trump's direct communications with Mr. Bannon regarding the planning for January 6th. This information should not be subject to any privilege at all. And certainly, there is no basis for absolute or unqualified privilege 
for presidential communications. More important now, there is no conceivably applicable privilege that could shield Mr. Bannon from testimony on all of the many other topics identified in this committee's subpoena. Because he has categorically refused to appear, we have no choice but to seek consequences for Mr. Bannon's failure to comply. Those consequences are not just important for this investigation. They are important for all congressional investigations. Mr. Bannon's and Mr. Trump's privilege arguments do, however, appear to reveal one thing. They suggest that President Trump was personally involved in the planning and execution of January 6th. And this committee will get to the bottom of that. Let me add one further thought, principally for my Republican colleagues. We all agree that America is the greatest nation on the face of God's earth. Truth, justice, and our Constitution have made America great. Almost every one of my colleagues knows in your hearts that what happened on January 6th was profoundly wrong. You all know that there is no evidence of widespread election fraud sufficient to have changed the results of the election. You all know that the Dominion voting machines were not corrupted by a foreign power. You know these claims are false. Yet former President Trump repeats them almost daily. And he has now urged Republicans not to vote in 2022 and 2024. This is a prescription for national self-destruction. I ask my colleagues, please consider the fundamental questions of right and wrong here. The American people must know what happened. They must know the truth. All of us who are elected officials must do our duty to prevent the dismantling of the rule of law and to ensure that nothing like that dark day in January ever happens again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Pursuant to notice, I now call up the report on a resolution recommending that the House of Representatives find Stephen K. Bannon in contempt of Congress for refusal to comply with a subpoena duly issued by the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. The report was circulated in advance and printed copies are available. The clerk shall designate the report. Report on a resolution recommending that the House of Representatives find Stephen K. Bannon in contempt of Congress for refusal to comply with the subpoena duly issued by the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Without objection, the report will be considered as read and open to amendments at any time. I recognize myself for the purpose of offering an amendment in the nature of a substitute now at the desk. The clerk shall report the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute offered by Mr. Thompson of Mississippi. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read and considered base text for purposes of further amendment. I'll now recognize myself to explain the amendment. Yesterday evening, counsel to Mr. Bannon requested a one-week adjournment of our response to a letter I wrote on October 15th, which stated that Mr. Bannon's willful defiance of the Select Committee's subpoena would lead to tonight's hearing. Without objection, I included my October 15th letter in the record, as well as yesterday's letter from Robert J. Costello, Mr. Bannon's attorney. Mr. Bannon's attorney said they needed time to, quote, assess the Select Committee's request in light of litigation filed by former President Trump in the District of Columbia District Court yesterday. However, the former president's lawsuit is immaterial to Mr. Bannon's defiance of our lawful subpoena. I made that clear in a letter to Mr. Costello this morning. 
without objections, my full letter is in the record. Furthermore, White House yesterday issued a letter to Mr. Bannon's attorney stating, quote, we are not aware of any basis for your client's refusal to appear for a deposition, end quote. Before the select committee and further said that, quote, President Biden has already determined that an assertion of executive privilege is not in the public interest and therefore is not justified with respect to certain subjects within the purview of the select committee, end quote. Without objection, I include the full White House letter in the record. This amendment in the nature of a substitute updates the report to reflect these developments, and it's now even clearer that Mr. Bannon has no lawful grounds not to comply with our subpoena. If there's no further debate, the question is on agreeing to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it, and an amendment in the nature of a substitute is agreed to. I now recognize the vice chair, Ms. Cheney, for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee favorably report to the House the committee's report on a resolution recommending that the House of Representatives find Stephen K. Bannon in contempt of Congress for refusal to comply with a subpoena duly issued by the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol as amended. The question on the motion is favorably report to the House. Those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chairs, the ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote is requested. The clerk will call the roll. Ms. Cheney? Aye. Ms. Lofgren? Yes. Ms. Lofgren? Aye. Aye. Ms. Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Schiff? Aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Mrs. Murphy? Aye. Mrs. Murphy? Aye. Mr. Raskin? Aye. Mr. Raskin? Aye. Mrs. Luria? Aye. Mrs. Luria? Aye. Mr. Kinzinger? Aye. Mr. Kinzinger, aye. Has the chair recorded? Mr. Chairman, you are not recorded. I vote aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. The clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, on this vote, there are nine ayes, zero noes. The motion is agreed to. The vice chair is recognized. Mr. Chairman, pursuant to Clause 2L of Rule 11, I request that members have two calendar days in which to file with the clerk of the committee supplemental or additional views on the measure ordered reported by the committee tonight. So ordered. Without objection, staff is authorized to make any necessary technical or conforming changes to the report to reflect the actions of the committee. There being no further business, without objection, the select committee stands adjourned. And there you just heard a unanimous vote there from the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot, determining that former Trump advisor Steve Bannon should be held in criminal contempt for refusing to comply with their committee's subpoena for his testimony. Uh, both Liz Cheney, who you see right there, as well as Benny Thomas on the screen right there, uh, outlining very clearly what they say, uh, the efforts they made to get this witness, Steve Bannon in this case, to comply uh, with their subpoena and his failure uh, to do so, and now we move on to uh, the next level, basically um, seeing if they can uh, prosecute him, uh, ultimately, something that would be punishable by one to 12 months in prison. Uh, likely this would potentially take years based on a, a number of appeals and, and acquittals. We'll certainly uh, talk to our team in the next hour more in depth about that, and we will be right back.
the ladies you love. The hottest topics happening now. There's only one place to find it all. You guys are having the hard conversations. I love The View. The most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A federal grand jury has indicted a Nebraska Republican congressman for allegedly concealing information and making false statements to authorities. According to the DOJ, Jeff Fortenberry repeatedly lied and misled authorities during an investigation looking into illegal contributions made to his campaign by a... a of a Nigerian-born billionaire. In a YouTube video, he said that he was stunned by the allegations and asked his supporters to rally behind him. Elijah McLean's family has reached a settlement with the city of Aurora over its violent arrest and death. The terms have not yet been disclosed. The 23-year-old died while walking home from a convenience store after an altercation with police that began with someone calling 911 saying that they saw someone sketchy. He was unarmed, his family today saying no amount of money can bring him back. And more than 10 months after Maya Millett, a mother of three, vanished in California, police today arrested her husband. A SWAT team reportedly stormed into the family home earlier today before they arrested Larry Millett. Chula Vista police say that they charged him with murder of his wife after interviewing more than 87 people and reviewing more than 128 tips. And we turn now back to Washington, where the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th riot has voted to recommend that former Trump advisor Steve Bannon be held in criminal contempt for defying their subpoena. Let's bring in our chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. And John, first, I'd like to get your reaction to this hearing tonight by the Select Committee and the case made by members on the need to hold Bannon in contempt. And in particular, Liz Cheney, because she also was coming for President Trump in this as well. Lindsay, there was no surprise in the outcome here, a nine to nothing vote to recommend criminal charges against Steve Bannon. We knew that was gonna happen. After all, uh, Republican leader Kevin McCarthy has not cooperated with this committee, has not appointed Republicans to it. The only two Republicans believe in this investigation uh, at the defiance, uh, in defiance of their Republican leadership, obviously Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger as well. But you're, you're right to, to, to point at the significance of Liz Cheney's remarks here. I, I thought they were were uh, very powerful, very pointed. They were directed at Donald Trump. They were also directed at fellow Republicans. Uh, and I thought that was what was most significant. She, speaking to fellow Republicans in the House, she said, you know that this stuff is not true. You know uh, that, uh, that, that the election, the lie the election was stolen was a lie. Take a listen uh, to what she said. Again, this message to her fellow House Republicans in your hearts that what happened on January 6th was profoundly wrong. You all know that there is no evidence of widespread election fraud sufficient to have changed the results of the election. You all know that the Dominion voting machines were not corrupted by a foreign power. Pick up her. So there, there you heard, she also said that what Donald Trump had been saying was a, quote, prescription for a national disaster. Uh, so, so very strong remarks uh, aimed at the business at hand, at the importance of getting Bannon uh, to comply with this subpoena and to prosecute him if he continues to refuse, but a much larger message that really, Lindsay, gets at the purpose of this committee, uh, the purpose of this committee to establish that what happened on January 6th was something uh, in, in the view of, of Liz Cheney, she has said this publicly consistently for months uh, in the view of many others, that what happened on January 6th was something that was directed uh, and, and provoked, but more than just provoked, was really 
part of the plan uh, coming right from Donald Trump, coming right from the White House. Right, yes, yeah, so specifically she was saying that, uh, that both former President Trump as well as Bannon had substantial knowledge and part of the planning. So what do you feel like we need to watch for next, both as far as the House and with the Justice Department on taking any action on Bannon? Well, the next step is the full House will vote uh, on Thursday next next week to, to on Thursday to have a, uh, a, a, a this referral go to the Justice Department. This was just the committee for this referral to be official. It needs to be voted on by the full House. Uh, but what to watch for in that vote, uh, Lindsay, is you know the Republicans. Uh, have, have a very large minority here. It's only a three-seat majority for Nancy Pelosi. I fully expect that every single Democrat will vote for this. It will pass the full House. Obviously, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger will vote for it. But what about the other Republicans? Will there be any other Republicans who say that it is wrong for Steve Bannon to totally and completely defy uh, this committee, a blanket refusal even to engage in negotiations uh, about testifying? Uh, this is in a you know something that is an assault on Congress's right to investigate. Uh, as you heard, Liz Cheney, she sees this as an assault on the rule of law. Will any of her fellow Republicans agree with that, even if they uh, don't agree with the overall uh, direction of this investigation? And we heard President Biden weigh in on the subpoena battle, agreeing that the Justice Department should take action. Uh, tell us how the White House responded today to questions about whether it was appropriate for the president to weigh in. Well, uh, Biden was asked on Friday, should Bannon and, the, and others who don't cooperate be prosecuted? Biden gave a very direct answer, as he often does. He says, yes, I do. Uh, yes, he believes they should be prosecuted. But, you know, <laughs> Joe Biden has also repeatedly said uh, and promised during his campaign, reiterated uh, as president, that he will let prosecutorial decisions be made at the Justice Department. They shouldn't be politicized. It is the attorney general who should make such decisions. So we heard uh, from White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki uh, saying, reaffirming, the decision on prosecuting will be made by the Justice Department. It will not be made by President Biden or anybody at the White House. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what that decision is. We have not heard uh, which way the Justice Department will go, just a reaffirmation that it will be a decision made by the Attorney General, full stop, no political interference. Uh, but my sense is uh, that Biden expressed a view uh, that is probably also held by his Attorney General. And John, lastly, before we let you go, former President Trump has filed a lawsuit trying to block the committee from accessing White House records. What's the former president claiming in that suit? Well, he's claiming that he has this blanket right to executive privilege, that none of these documents, these White House documents, can be turned over. And he's going further than that. He's also uh, offering another argument that there is no legislative purpose to this request, uh, which is uh, an argument that this White House has used in the past uh, to block uh, cooperation uh, with congressional requests. It is not a particularly strong case, uh, according to most uh, legal experts experts that have looked at this. Uh, after all, the current president has said that this is not a question of executive privilege, that he wants to see these documents released. But there is, there are multiple aims here, Lindsay. Uh, on one hand, obviously, uh, they're trying to win this case. But if they're not going to win the case, they want to delay. They want to delay uh, this hearing. They want to delay this investigation. They want to draw this out in the hopes that Republicans uh, win control of the House, which they very well may do next year, and that this investigation will be uh, short-circuited before it is completed. I appreciate all of your expertise and insight. Jonathan Carl joining us live from the Thank Capitol you. tonight. Thank you. And now let's bring in ABC News political director Rick Klein. Rick, we certainly don't often hear hearings like this in prime time. Do you feel like the committee was trying to uh, send a message here? No question, Lindsay. This was an unusual hearing in terms of the timing, in terms of the format. And as John pointed out, the fact that they put Congresswoman Liz Cheney front and center to deliver that message, particularly to the Republicans, that tells you what they're trying to accomplish. The testimony of Steve Bannon would be very interesting to this committee, but they're under no pretension about the idea that he would suddenly flip on Donald Trump and give over all of his private communications, everything that he said and heard that day, even if he were compelled to do so, even if he were ultimately jailed, which are several steps away. 
it's not likely that he's going to play ball with this committee. But what the committee is trying to say here is that for all witnesses that might have relevant information, they are going to press this and press this hard. And they are going to take this case directly to the American people, directly to the public, to remind people of the horrors of January 6th, of the questions that are still out there, and make this about more than just what happens within the four corners of a committee hearing room. They want this case to be understood by the public. And if that means bringing the, the, the hearings in prime time, if that makes, means making splashy efforts to, to try to compel testimony, that's precisely what they're going to do. And the, and the message that Congresswoman Cheney had directly for her Republican colleagues, that you all know what happened, uh, and this is ultimately self-destructive for democracy, that's a powerful message. And that's what I think this committee is going to try to showcase going forward. And early on, we heard from Benny Thompson as well, saying, what would happen to you if you did what uh, Steve Bannon has done, really making it plain for the American people? And when you talk about uh, the public in general, where do most Americans stand right now as far as how justifiable or necessary this committee's work is at this point? Yeah, it's interesting when you look at a, a latest Quinnipiac poll that came out just tonight, you're seeing that most Americans actually feel like they know enough about January uh, January 6th, that they don't feel like there's additional information necessarily that could be gleaned from this effort. But that same poll also had a majority, 51 percent, saying that President Trump has been undermining democracy since January 6th, and a larger margin than that, 59 percent, uh, saying that in their view, January 6th was an attack on democracy. So people have internalized this. I think the question for the committee is how much you continue to hammer that home, remind people of what happened just that nine, nine or ten months ago, uh, and, and again, how terrible that day was. Uh, even though right now there isn't a sense among the public that there are unanswered questions, clearly there are things we don't know, including what the president's role was uh, in and around that date. We may never learn everything around it. As John reported, we could, he could be playing out the clock quite a bit here over the ensuing months. But the effort by this committee to try to keep this in the news, keep this in the headlines, keep this as a focus and a piece of conversation, I think is going to be a big one. And we know so much surrounding this investigation into January 6th has really been clouded by politics. If this process does get delayed through court challenges and runs deeper into next year, what kind of impact do you think that this could potentially have on the midterms, both in primaries and the general election next fall? Yeah, it's fascinating, Lindsay, because it's going to mean different things in different places. Uh, for Congresswoman Cheney, who we saw so much of just tonight, she's got a primary challenger who's being supported by President Trump. And the message that President Trump is trying to, to send to all Republicans is that if you cross him, you're going to do that at your political peril and that it could cut back against you. But the message to uh, more mainstream Republicans, uh, other Republicans who are now at least quietly uh, concerned about how Trump has handled all of this but won't say so publicly, the message that's being sent is that you're going to pay a political price for that, that people are going to be reminded of what happened on January 6th. And the timeline here is so interesting because the Democrats control the clock, but so much of the information could be controlled by former President Trump and the people around him. The Democrats could spread this out as much as they want. They could wrap it up as quickly as they want. They want to report out, though, that voters will have in time for the midterms, that they'll be able to take into consideration any of the information in the revelations, any of the concrete findings before next November, because the closer you get to Election Day, the more political size that's going to be, the more political it looks. Uh, but again, they, they don't want too much time to, to be spaced out there either. So it's going to be a little bit of a dance between all of these different entities over the next 13 months or, months or so. Rick Klein, thank you so much. Appreciate all of your insight as well. And now we move back to the desperate efforts to rescue a missionary group that was kidnapped in Haiti. The FBI has now made contact with a gang suspected of holding the 16 Americans and one Canadian. They are demanding millions for their safe return. ABC's Marcus Moore once again on the ground for us in Haiti tonight and actually caught up with a priest who was kidnapped and freed by that suspected gang. Tonight, the violent gang in Haiti accused of kidnapping 17 members of a U.S. Christian organization demanding $17 million for their release, $1 million per hostage, according to a senior Haitian police official. Their demand comes as the FBI makes contact with the 400 Mawozo gang, who Haitian authorities say are holding the group hostage. The rise in violence leading to widespread protests across the capital. And so this is what we've seen here in this part of Port-au-Prince, where um, at any moment people will choose to stop vehicles that are trying to drive up the hill. We tried to drive up the road just earlier, and we're told to turn around. And so that is just a bit of what life is like right now uh, here in Port-au-Prince. People are angry, and uh, they want stability in their country.
And tonight, we're learning the ages of those 16 Americans and one Canadian kidnapped. The adults ranging in age from 18 to 48, and among the five children, an eight-month-old baby. The group, part of the Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries, and was in Haiti working on several humanitarian projects, including home building and teaching school children. Before the kidnapping Saturday, they had just visited this orphanage that received support from the organization. So many now praying for their safe return, including Father Jean Millian, who says he and nine others were kidnapped in April by the same gang. They were held for 20 days and then freed. Even the, the time is difficult, but uh, we do not have to, to lose our, our hope in God. Keeping the faith there, our thanks to Marcus. And now to the latest in the pandemic. News from the FDA about mixing and matching boosters. This as more people get vaccinated. COVID-19 infections, deaths, and hospitalizations appear to steadily fall across the country. Meanwhile, the battle against vaccine mandates continues. Ariel Reshef has more. Tonight, an expected green light from the FDA could be hours away for some Americans who want to mix vaccines by boosting their original vaccine with a different brand. A source telling ABC News regulators will likely still recommend people get the same vaccine brand for their booster shot, but it won't be required. We now know that J&J wanes more quickly than the mRNA vaccines, and being able to give more options to patients is important. There is some evidence that people who got the one-shot Johnson & Johnson vaccine may benefit more from a booster with an mRNA vaccine. A limited study looking at antibodies, which is just one measure of protection, found that an extra shot of the same Johnson & Johnson vaccine boosted antibodies by four times. But when J&J &J was boosted with Pfizer, antibodies jumped 35 times and 76 times after a boost with Moderna. Some who got the J&J &J vaccine still want to stick with it for their booster shot. Yeah, I'd rather stay with one course and just keep it that way. Vaccinations are driving cases down across the country. But in 10 states with colder climates, as more people spend time inside, cases and hospital admissions are climbing again. I really do not want to see another horrific fall winter wave like we saw uh, last year. And I think it's possible. And tonight, experts are calling for more aggressive study on new variants. A descendant of Delta, AY.4.2, now makes up at least 6% of cases in the UK, where COVID deaths just hit their highest point since March. Researchers here in the U.S. are using genomic sequencing to identify and track new variants. From the data that I've seen, um, cases of the AY4.2 have been seen in about five states, maybe about seven cases total. 99% of U.S. cases are Delta, but scientists want to know whether this new variant is more transmissible. We need to remain vigilant uh, whether uh, this variant will turn out to be a problem or, or not. Until this is controlled everywhere in the world, we all remain at risk. Our thanks to Ariel for that. And switching gears now to Jessica Simpson. The pop star is now officially back in charge of her billion-dollar empire. ABC's Rebecca Jarvis has the story and how she did and what other business owners can learn from her experience. This okay, is me. This is like you. The brave me. Entertainer turned business mogul Jessica Simpson is taking full control of her eponymous billion-dollar brand alongside her mom, Tina. <laughs> Jessica and her mom negotiating for full ownership with parent company Sequential Brands Group, who filed for bankruptcy earlier this year. Jessica telling Footwear News, it means the absolute world to me to be able to take over complete ownership of my brand. After 16 years in business, I feel ready to meet this next exciting phase with open arms. Jessica Simpson regaining control of her brand is ensuring that the brand, Jessica Simpson, doesn't lose value as it gets passed along from selling and reselling. The star also adding, I know the sky is the limit when my mom, our incredible team, and I lock into our customers completely. The brand, founded in 2005, known for fun and flirty looks like these, includes shoes, apparel, accessories, and home goods. Jessica telling she wanted the brand to reflect all women. I wanted to celebrate every woman at yeah. every size. I've been a size two up to a 14. Yes. I wanted women to know that, you know, being perfect is not fun. No. And nobody can be. And while Jessica and her mom get back to running the business, 
her experience reveals lessons for any business owner. In most instances, when you sign a licensing deal, you don't have control over where your name is gonna go, or what product it's gonna get assigned to. Now, Jessica and her mom will be able to make those decisions for themselves and figure out what product is in line with their branding and maybe even extend it to a different product mix. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis. And now to author Michael Wolf, best known for his three bestsellers about Donald Trump. And now he's out with a new book called Too Famous, The Rich, The Powerful, The Wishful, The Notorious, The Damned, which includes conversations with the notorious sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. ABC's Deborah Roberts sat down with Wolf. In his new book, Too Famous, Michael Wolf says an intoxicating thirst for that bright light of fame has sent powerful people spiraling. Everybody always wants more. And more is what leads to too famous and to destruction. Is fame necessarily corrosive? Yeah, I think it is. It is often ruinous. His list of too famous subjects, including Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, Hillary Clinton, and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Epstein proposed that, that I write a book about him, and uh, he gives me access to him on a frequent basis, access to what was going on in his, in his house. So I, I kind of- So you were a guest in his home? Yes. I'm not sure anyone who I'm writing about quite makes the distinction ab about whether I am um, you know, a fly on the wall or a guest at the banquet. Wolf claiming that in 2019, he was in the room and recorded this never released audio as political operative Steve Bannon tried to media train Epstein for a potential television interview. Money never interested me. Money never interested me, no. Money's to me is only numbers. How many houses do you have? I don't know. You don't know how many houses you have. Bannon disputes your account in the recordings and uh, even told the New York Times that he did no media training for Epstein, that the interviews were about a documentary. Well, it's, it's just not true. The entire discussion was, was about, about media training. He says Epstein was matter of fact about the young women in his life, saying that some lied about their ages. Did Jeffrey Epstein realize that people thought of him as a predator, as a oh, bad yes. guy? Oh, yes, absolutely. He had a grasp of that. Completely. Wolf is no stranger to controversy himself and has faced criticism for not attributing to sources. Do you consider yourself a journalist or a writer? I consider myself a writer. I, I, I want to bring you into the experience. I want you to believe that you are in the room. What makes them talk to you? I have no idea. Are you shocked that sometimes they sit I, and talk to you? I'm always shocked, oh, always. And despite the often brutal portrayals of his subjects, Wolf says the two famous often sought him out anyway to write about them, like Harvey Weinstein. He said, come down to the, come down to the show, the trial. It will be really good. You'll really like it. Um, um, he really called it a show. Yeah, no. Um, we'll arrange good seats. The whole thing, as though this is a premiere. And I said, Harvey, I'm not going to write a book about you. And he said, you know, <laughs> you think I'm a nice guy, um, um, but but you know I, I can I can turn into um, Michael Corleone like that. And then m minutes later, I start getting texts from from Harvey. He didn't mean it. I'm so sorry. And he has no idea that this is um, uh, uh, unacceptable, crazy behavior. Because he became too famous? Exactly. Really fascinating conversation there. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. And still to come, the chance encounter that led to a life-saving procedure. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. This is American history, a violent white mob, a brutal attack. 300 black Americans killed right here in America. Now, it is time to uncover Tulsa's buried truth. The gripping story brought to light in a new podcast from ABC News. Available now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. A family on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. Now with so much on the line, more Americans are turning to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight than any other program across all of television. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Dozens are dead after torrential rain triggered massive floods in northern India. According to local officials, some people continue to be missing while others are trapped under debris. Landslides and floods are common in India's Himalayan region, but scientists say that they're becoming even more frequent as a result of global warming and how it contributes to the melting of glaciers there. Today marks one month since the volcano on the Spanish island of La Palma has been spewing lava. So far, more than 1,800 buildings, mostly homes, have been destroyed. The latest satellite imagery shows molten rock layered across nearly 19,000 acres. Acres. The government has pledged millions of dollars to help rebuild damaged infrastructure. Cuba is preparing for months of intense debate surrounding a new law that would allow same-sex marriage and surrogate pregnancies. The law would change the legal definition of marriage, which currently specifies is only between a man and a woman. While some Christian leaders have spoken out against the proposal, the Cuban justice minister called the effort, quote, a social reality. Finally tonight, the complete strangers becoming best friends after a chance encounter led to a life-saving procedure. Ashton Packer from our affiliate WGXA in Georgia has this story. Meet the Garys and the Moody's. I love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> this past spring, these acquaintances became each other's chosen family. I grew up by myself, on the child, and I feel like this is the sister She's supposed to be my sister. In January, Chris Gary began struggling with his health. His kidneys were slowly failing him. He needed a transplant to stay alive. With an O negative blood type, his chances of finding a viable donor were slim to none. Just 8% of white Americans have O negative. For black Americans, it's only 4%. With nothing to do but wait, Chris went about his life in pain, then, a miracle happened. Sunday school, we were in Sunday school and it came up as a prayer request and that's when we found out that uh, he was on dialysis. Uh, we didn't have a clue, like you said, he hit it really well. Without knowing if they would be a match or really knowing Chris at all, Josh Moody made up his mind to be the donor. I woke up the next morning and I knew, you know, basically God said, you're, you're giving Chris a kidney. It was a perfect match. A 98% match. Like the only thing closer would have been identical twins. Together, Chris and Josh went through the transplant process for months. Lord knows how much blood work. Um, mm -hmm. I think the final count for testing was like 67 vials of blood or something like that. 
Both men made full recoveries with no issues. All four say that the ordeal was nothing other than a message from God, divine intervention. Just knowing, like 100%, this is my purpose in life, this is why God created me was to donate this kidney to Chris. The Moody's and the Gary's say they believe the experience was meant to bring them together, to share their story with anyone who ever questioned if there was a higher power. God, God is real and you must have faith. The four say their mission now is to start a kindness chain, to encourage people to lend a hand, no matter how big and to be open to the fact that the person you need most in your life might be right in front of you. Reporting from Jones County, Ashton Packer. Kindness chain sounds like a welcome idea. Our thanks to Ashton for that. And that'll do it for us tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed.